I know this might seem hard to believe, but I turned 50 this year, which means that the people I went to school with also turned 50 this year. Now, a few of them got together and thought, what a great idea to celebrate this landmark occasion and to have a school reunion. The only problem with that is I went to school in Lockerbie, which is in southwest Scotland, but for the past 25 years, I've lived in the southeast of England, in Surrey. Now, it's 350 miles between my house and Lockerbie. It's not far. And if you're a regular reviewer of OTV, you will know that I conduct a lot of our road test reviews up in Scotland when I go up there. The difference is this time, I normally spend a bit more time when I'm up there. You know, I've got, my mum lives there, my son lives there, so I get to see family and I spend a few days up there. And, you know, and filming a road test review does take a little bit of time. But this time's different. I leave tomorrow morning. Tomorrow is Friday. The reunion is on Saturday and I have to be back here at home on Sunday to take my daughter to school on Monday morning because my wife's at a business meeting she cannot get out of, so there is no option in this. But again, 700 miles in that space of time isn't a massive problem really. But then you've got to factor in seeing family, going to this reunion, enjoying a few little fruity Beaujolais with some old school pals, and of course filming a road test review and then getting back. So it's going to be quite tiring, which means the car that I'm going to have to use is going to have to help me. It's going to have to cause me. It's going to have to eat up those miles. In other words, it's going to have to be a Grand Tourer, a GT. So what better car to choose? The one that's actually called GT. Well, this should do the trick nicely. Welcome to this week's road test review. Welcome to the Audi e-tron GT RS. And as always, welcome to Auto EV. Now, before we get started on this week's road test review of the Audi e-tron RS GT, it is, of course, that time when I'd ask you to make sure you are subscribed to the Auto EV channel. Now, once you've done that, make sure you press the little bell button down below because then you'll be notified when our next video is uploaded and it goes live. Once you've watched the video, if you do enjoy it, make sure you give it a thumbs up. And of course, don't forget, leave us your comments down below. Let us know what your thoughts are on the cars review, such as the e-tron RS GT, and of course, on the Auto EV channel as a whole. Now, for the sake of continuity, a little confession to make here. The reunion has been and gone. And I did plan on filming with the car when I was in Scotland. Now you're watching this a little bit later than when this event actually took place. And the problem was, during October, during this particular weekend where I was in Scotland, whilst the, the south of England where I live was basking in, as you can tell, some unseasonably warm weather for October, Scotland was being a bit more true to form. In other words, it was, well, how do I put it politely? It was lashing down. Um, I just couldn't film. It was just biblical rain when I was up there. So I had to wait till I've come back to film the review. So apologies for that. However, it was and a great opportunity to put this car through its paces. Now, we've driven the Audi e-tron before. We featured it when it was first launched, of course, but I'd never driven the RS version. And as you know, if you're a regular viewer, we've been featuring quite a lot of these kind of performance oriented EVs of late. So uh, the Mercedes AMG EQS 53, uh, Kia EV6 GT, MG4 X Power, Tesla Model S Plaid, blah, 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 blah. And I wanted to know whether or not Audi's only electric RS model really did live up to the billing and whether or not it was a better car than the car which it shares a lot of its componentry with. In other words, my favourite EV, the Porsche Taycan. And that only meant one thing, road trip. But before we start, let's take a little reminder about what the Audi e-tron GT actually is. Well, it sits on the J1 platform, shared, as we said, with the Porsche Taycan. There are two versions available, either the standard GT, which we've already road tested, or this, the more powerful GT RS, making it the only fully electric Audi RS model. It has up to 646 PS available, allowing for a 0-60 time of just 3.3 seconds. It has a usable battery capacity of 83.7 kWh, allowing for a WLTP range of up to 298 miles. And it's priced from just under £120,000 up to just over £140,000, depending on your chosen trim levels and options. So sharing a lot of commonality with its sister brand Porsche and its Taycan, does that mean that this is literally just a Taycan with the four rings of English stat on it? Or does it have its own particular set of skills? And should you spend your money with Audi rather than Porsche? 
Well, the only way that we're going to find out is by putting it through the road test that actual car buyers trust when it comes to choosing their next electric vehicle. And that is the Auto EV one. Now, as always, we're going to start with styling. And, well, let's not beat around the bush with this, shall we? This is a sensational looking car, I think. I think this is Audi's best looking car since the Mark 1 TT. In fact, I might even go a little stage further than that and say I think it's even better looking than the Mark 1 TT. And it's maybe a controversial thing to say this, I'm not sure. Depending how you feel, but I think it's a much better looking car than the Taycan, and I like the Taycan. Anyway, and the interesting thing is, there's not one person I came across with this car over the, uh, the time I've had it that doesn't agree with that. Nobody looks at it and goes, oh, it's just a big Audi. They all look at it and go, wow, what a great looking car. And it is. I think it's sensational. Audi have got, they've always had been a very neat sort of design to them. But I always think they're a bit kind of Russian doll-esque, you know, sort of like, you know, the A4 just looks like a slightly smaller A6 and, you know, which is a slightly smaller A8 and their, their, their SUV range is exactly the same. But this isn't. This really stands out and it has, well, I think it has massive presence about it. It's just sexy looking. I apologise for using that uh, terminology, but it really is. Those hips at the back, oh, they certainly don't lie. The front, you, well, you've got your kind of trapezoidal grill shape without being a grill because obviously you've got this body colour section here. Your cooling's done down at the bottom. And you've got a couple of the big kind of radar sensors down at the bottom there as well for the, you know, the radar guided cruise control. These veins at the side here that just channel air around and spare air down the side uh, of those big alloy wheels. These lights are worth a mention as well. I was driving the car at night the other night and as I say, it was horrible weather. But these laser lights, these automatic laser lights, they are quick to respond to oncoming traffic and this, the, the, the spread of light that they give you, you know, you're driving in bad weather conditions, it's phenomenally good. So hats off Audi, great bit of practicality there combined with sensational looks. And of course at the front you've got your four rings of English stat there. But yeah, great looking car, huge amount of presence on the road as well. I love it. No, oh, interestingly enough as well, the colour, this is Suzuka grey, it's not white, although it does look, it's metallic Suzuka grey. And again, because of that, it just kind of makes all the other little details kind of stand out. I love it in the dark greys and blacks, but I do like this colour as well. But good looking car, yeah? Now, as you come round the side, you can see the sort of type of car that is, is this kind of four-door GT car, very much like the Taycan. And maybe in some respects, it's this side profile where you can see where the two of them would maybe share commonality. But as I say, they're very different to drive. Now, there's three trim levels within each of the two e-trons. So there's base model and this RS. This is the base RS, if you can call it the base, which means it gets these silver finished 21-inch uh, alloy wheels. The next two models up, which are the carbon black edition and the Vorsprung, get a different style of wheels. These are probably my least favourite wheels on the car that I've seen, in fairness. But they're not bad, they're all right. They're 21 inches and you get good gear tyres on them as well. They are quite... Um, um, eco-centric uh, the tyres on the car but they still give a good amount of grip because bear in mind it's all-wheel drive it's a quattro as well anyway we'll come on to talk about that later uh, you get two charging ports on the car depending obviously this side here is just your standard kind of type 2 connector on the other side the near side is where you get your CCS charger your fast charger so bear that in mind if you're, you're pulling up to a rapid charger it's on the passenger side of the car and um, the, the vent here to obviously let airflow build it the airflow that comes around the wheel and obviously any air pressure that builds up in the wheel arch is going to be vented out here and um, you get your contrasting black door mirrors you can have it again depending on the car with a carbon roof this has got the panoramic roof that's what I would have if I was you because I think it, it just opens the cabin up and lets a load of light in. So that's a really, um, I think it's a worthwhile thing to have. Down at the bottom, you get this contrast black there. Again, like I always say, it kind of pinches the bodywork and makes it look really, really slick. This is the bit I love here. These rear wheel arch um, blisters around here reminds me of the original Ur Quattro and it just gives it such a good look to the car. This kind of rear three quarters is the, probably the best angle in the car but I've yet to find a bad angle on it in fairness. But yeah, good looking car. And look at it around the back. Look at that. Nicest bum since Kylie I think. It's a great looking car, this, it really is. And the thing is, it doesn't look like, as I say, it doesn't look like a, any other Audi model. They've really managed to give this its own identity and style, and it looks very different to a Taycan, obviously. You get your big light bar across the back, which Audi really do like. And of course, it does this kind of fancy kind of Knight Rider style dance when you lock and unlock it at night. I can't show you today in this bright sunlight, um, but I'll try and put some B-roll up of the car at night where you can see it, what it, what it does. It looks great. Um, 
what else have you got? Well, of course, you've got your kind of rear diffuser here where obviously airflow just comes up and it helps the whole car just kind of suck down onto the rear of the ground. Sorry, suck down onto the ground. And um, you've got a slightly movable sort of like rear wing that operates at higher speed as well. You've got your RS badge there and of course your Audi e-tron GT there and then just your four Audi rings there. Look, I can talk for hours about this car and every time you look at it there's another little detail just these lines that come here and how tight they are and how close they are and just just the sharpness to the whole look about the car but i'm not going to talk for hours obviously and this is my opinion of course but it's you that matter because you're the buying public what do you think best looking audi that they've done or am i just absolutely havering as always let me know your thoughts in the comments down below now a grand tour needs obviously to have an element of practicality about it because there's no point in taking four people across Europe. You can't fit the luggage in. Thankfully, in the e-tron GTRS, you can. 405 litres of boot space, which is bigger than the Lexus UX 300e small family crossover. So it is quite practical. Now it doesn't have a lift back, so your limiting factor is this kind of aperture. That's about it. There's a tiny, tiny little bit of underfloor storage, but not really enough. The cables come in bags, but there is another place for those, as I'll show you. But do the four Auto V suitcases fit? Of course they do. You need to pop your large one in there. You pop your medium-sized one in there. And then, of course, you can pop your carry-ons on the top of them there. And as you can see, there's still room to spare as well. So it is practical enough to um, fill, um, fulfill its sort of like GT credentials. There's also a load through um, into the back seats as well. So if you're carrying longer items, you can get that through. But as I say, there's also another area where you can store some extra bags and your cables, but that's up at the front. The only odd thing about it is where the release is for it. So if you're ever looking at an e-tron, I'll tell you where it is. Believe it or not, it's in the door shut, just down on the driver's door. Pop that and it pops it up. Now. Bear in mind, as I say, this is a dual motor car, so all wheel drive. So there's a motor that's mounted obviously up at the front. But in terms of space, it's not bad. I mean, as I say, I've got the cables stored in there, but that's quite a deep well. You'd get another sort of like a carry-on suitcase in there if you weren't lugging the cables around with you. It's probably similar in size if you've been used to a Porsche 911, that style of front boot as well. So yeah, it is practical enough to fulfill those GT credentials. So Rear seat space. Well, that driving seat set up for myself and I'm 5'8". <sighs> Bags are in. And it's actually really quite pleasant back here, in fairness. Now, this is what I was saying about having the panoramic roof because it just lets a lot more light in it. The Audi interiors are quite dark and grey. So that's where I would make sure that you always have the pan roof because it just seems to open the interior up more. Now, there are three seat belts across the back here but to be honest with you nobody's going to sit there it's a four-seater car because you've got this transmission tunnel oddly um, although it's a dedicated ev platform but there is a transmission tunnel there so i don't know why but anyway but there's no way nobody's going to sit comfortably in that middle bit but certainly you know sort of like four people in here is just going to be well it's going to be absolutely fine i mean obviously we're not talking about bmw i7 and mercedes-benz eqs levels of space but remember it's a gt car you know if you're coming from you know, Porsche 911 or, you know, sort of like a Ferrari or whatever, and you want to get, you know, sort of like, you know, go electric and you want this kind of GT style of car, this is going to be absolutely ample for you. Plenty of legroom, good headroom for me, but again, like I always say, if you're probably getting on the six foot mark, you're going to feel it a little bit tight. Um, yeah, Isofix points, yes, of course, you've got sort of like them under the plastic cover, so they're nice and easily accessible. And as I say, you've also got um, a bit of storage here as well. You've got door pockets which are quite shallow you won't get a, a water bottle in the door pocket but you've got two cup holders which in there's rubber line tray in this center armrest so that's ideal plus as well if i get the right thing that's it as i say you've got load through as well so you can carry longer items or just maybe even a slightly nicer armrest if you put your arm on so yeah there's plenty in terms of space back here for two people uh face fence down there you've also got rear climate controls there and there's usb ports i think the usb c yeah they are just on uh, at the front of the squab um, of the rear seat bench so in terms of looking at it where it sits in its class as i say yes there are bigger cars such but they're proper dedicated big saloon cars but in terms of the Taycan and the e-tron GTRS, they're on a par, and I would say this is absolutely perfect to fulfill those grand touring credentials. 
Okay, let's have a wee chat about the interior of the car. Now, if you've watched my original e-tron GT review, you'll know that I sought to criticise the interior of the car. And I do still stand by that a little bit, but let me just sort of like explain why. What I said back then was, you, you sit in the Taycan and you feel like you're, you're sitting in a Porsche from 10 years in the future, and you sit in the e-tron and you feel like you could be sitting in any Audi, you know, whether it's an A3 or an A4 or an A6 or whatever. And I do still stand by that. However... That's not knocking its functionality, which is the important thing. Everything works really, really well. And as I say, having done quite, obviously quite a long journey in a short space of time in the car, you do come to appreciate an interior that's well thought out and well built and easy to use. But as I say, I just like the style to be a little bit, you know, a bit more kind of, I don't know, like the outside, as I say, doesn't look like any other Audi. Whereas the interior, you get in it and you go, oh yeah, it looks like an A4 in here. But see, you can't knock it in terms of its functionality, and you certainly can't knock it in terms of its build quality. It is phenomenally brilliant in here. Everything that you you know you touch in terms of your buttons, you know they've got a nice tactility. Everything clicks. We'll talk about you know the fact that it is a physical button uh, that the car has in here in a second or so, because they say you know you're trying to use something at speed on the motorway turning off your air conditioning or adjusting temperature or believe it or not like i was yesterday even switching a heated seat on which you wouldn't believe today but trust me in scotland yesterday you needed it uh the other thing i want to talk about just before we jump into the like, what, where where everything is and what they are is the materials now i don't i love the exterior of this car in terms of the suzuka gray paint and as i said i wasn't particularly keen on the wheels this is the leather free interior on this car now i'd be very very careful if you're looking at the car um, and, and you need to spend a lot of time specking it just right because whilst I don't mind the fact it doesn't have leather, I do object to the, the material they've used. It's just this grey kind of tweed cloth. Two things, it doesn't feel special enough for a car of this price and it doesn't feel special enough for an Audi wearing the RS badge in my opinion. Um, you know, the, they've got Alcantara across the, 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 bit, the instrument binnacle and the steering wheel. Why not use that on the seats? That would have been good. Or, you know, like, Audi used to do this material on the original uh, Quattro and the Coupes. I think it was called Jacquard Satin, and where it had the Quattro script through it. I mean, if they'd done a sort of like a modern interpretation of that, I think that would look phenomenal in here. But this kind of grey cloth, just, it kind of feels like a base sales rep A4 to me, and I don't think it, it should be at this price level of car. The same with the dashboard, you know, you've got a lot of gloss black, kind of piano black here and down here, which is, as you know, it just, I mean, it's just getting dusty now and it's got fingerprints all over it. It's just horrible. And this kind of grey thing here, you can spec other things, that's my point. So just spend a bit of time, if you are looking at one of these cars, going through the options, making sure that you do spec it right. Because as I say, whilst it's nice in terms of its build quality, I just think visually it needs as much lift as it can in here. So that's my point. Right, enough of that. Functionality, brilliant. Right, so you've got a smaller screen than you maybe get on some cars, especially the likes of the EQS with its hyper screen and the BMW i7 and, of course, Tesla with the Model S Plaid. But it's Audi's infotainment screen and it works really, really well. What's nice is every time you touch it, you get that nice kind of click. You do get a really nice um, click to it. So every time you, you press it on there, it just feels like you've done something. And then you swipe through to get your little icons where you want. Now, it does have wireless Apple CarPlay um, and Android Auto. However, there's a wireless charging pad in here, which I can't get it to take my phone. And I've only got an iPhone 12. Um, so I'm actually using a wire to keep my phone charged as well. But there is wireless charging in there. But for some reason, I can't get my phone into it. Maybe it's me, maybe I'm being a bit silly, but there you go. Um, in terms of storage, you've got this kind of console uh, down in there. You've obviously got, as you can see, two cup holders here, which will take my water bottle and my big Yeti um, coffee flask. Door bins, they're quite shallow. Um, they'll take sunglasses case, but don't put anything too tall in them, because when you shut the door or when you open it, they have a tendency to fall out. Um, so just watch yourself with that. And then, of course, you've got glove box as well there so that's absolutely fine so there's, there's reasonable storage in here and again like i was saying in the back having the big panoramic roof especially this kind of dark gray color uh lets a lot of light into the car so it doesn't feel claustrophobic that kind of sleek roof line um doesn't kind of transcend into a car that makes you feel like you're enclosed into it because it lets a lot of light in the car so as i say that really is a worthwhile thing to have i want to talk about the seats because they are absolutely sensational, these seats. 
Um, you know, you know, looking on the outside, that's one thing that people have commented on how good looking the car is. The second thing they tend to say is how comfortable the seats are. Now, as I say, I've done 700 miles over the weekend in this car, and I've got a bigger journey to do later this week as well. Um, and I know it's going to be just blissful to do it because they hold you in all the right places. There's enough shoulder support. There's good lateral support. You can electrically move this, uh, move the squab out to give you more support underneath the back of your thighs, you can tilt the seats, you've got reach and rake adjustment on the steering wheel as well, so it's impossible not to find the perfect driving position in this car, um, it is absolutely fantastic. The only thing I would, I would say is, I'd quite like these head restraints to be able to move slightly forward just to rest the back of my head on, like you can do in sort of like, you know, the, the Mercedes EQS. Um, they don't seem to move, they're, they're fixed in position, so that's the only downside, but I mean it's a minor, minor point that. Driver instrumentation binnacle, well that's quite configurable, again depending how you like the car set up. So you can have your kind of big speed readout in the centre there with your range um, and all your little ancillaries down the bottom, a trip on that side and then on the left screen depending on what you want you can have your navigation there, you can have your mobile phone up, you can have just the date and time or uh, you can have your media playing for instance if you want your media playing up there and using your map there. You can also um, turn the whole uh, this is kind of the virtual cockpit as I would call it. So you can turn the whole screen, the whole display into your navigation map and use that for just media or whatever. And then from there you can actually even zoom in and out of the map using the little thumb wheel here. I mean, it is superb. It really is. Audi just, as I say, the, the, the way that they do their interiors is phenomenal. And as I say, the build quality is second to none. You know, it is just, everything is solid. It feels like it's just going to last a million years in here. If somebody was to take a big rock with a hammer and a chisel and chip away at it to make a car interior, this is what they'd end up with because, you know, it's, it's absolutely superb. Steering wheel, right thickness, I think. Not too thick on the rim, just really nice wheel to hold. As I say, this one's Alcantara, which I do like. You know, it makes it nice and kind of grippy. Physical buttons again, so the actual click when you when you press them so that's nice and then you get little thumb wheels you know for scrolling through um whether or not you're adjusting the, the zoom on the map um or whether you're just scrolling through sort of like your trip computer um or what you're needing to, to see off that your range your short-term memory um trip your long-term memory trip it's all noted in there what well, have i done 952 miles uh in the last four days um and we'll talk about you know economy and stuff i'm getting 2.7 miles per kilowatt hour as an average so there we go um uh, adjustable uh, regen uh, on the paddles behind the steering column again nice they're aluminium they're nice and tactile column stocks take note tesla uh indicators and lights wipers on the right cruise control on the third one down at the bottom there and then your usual bits and pieces you know your light switches down your right knee and then your door controls for your mirrors and such like there so look i'm not going to wax on too long about this um but what i would say is this two things first of all functionality and build quality absolutely off the scale superb really easy to use i love the fact it's got physical heating and ventilation controls and they work just with that nice little click so when you're driving along you know you just don't have to worry too much about being in a screen and taking your eyes off the road that's the first thing the second thing as i say you know in terms of the build quality it's just you know beyond reproach it's just superb i'd just like to see a little bit more style go into the interior that's all and that's what i mean by that i'm not faulting it in terms of the way it works i'm just saying the way that it visually looks should maybe be a little like they've done with the outside it doesn't look like another audi whereas the interior does and i suppose in some respects if you're if you're an audi customer and you're coming into an e-tron gt you'll like the fact you know maybe trading up from a tt or something you'll like the fact that everything works like you're used to but i just like it to be visually a bit more exciting in here which brings me on to my last thing which is i saying if you're specking a car up if you're choosing one spend time making sure you get the right spec because some of the materials i think um, on this particular car aren't worthy of the money, but some of the interiors I've seen on, on e-tron GTs um, are. So just spend a bit of time making sure you get the right spec of your car. But as I say, in terms of the way that it works, in terms of the way that it's built, you can't fault it. Now, the RS e-tron GT has a usable battery capacity of 83.7 kilowatt hours. Now that should give, according to WLTP figures, a range of up to 293 miles. The reality is, you're not really going to get that, are you? I mean, I've been charging up to full over the last few days and I've been seeing around about 230, 240 miles out of a charge. 
but in fairness that has also been all motorway work but i've got a couple of little things to say on this battery and the charging of this car um which hopefully will put your mind at rest when you hear those kind of figures of just over 200 miles range so as i say um lockerbie um to, to london or london to lockerbie you know the trip 350 miles i set off the other day uh, from home with just under 80% battery and I drove an hour up to Banbury where Instavolt have got a big hub now and I stuck it on 150 kilowatt charger there. Now the, the e-tron GTRS will take charging speeds up to 270 kilowatts because it runs an 800 volt architecture and it means you can go from 10 to 80% on anything above 150 kilowatt charger in around about 23 minutes. So that's what I did. I drove up there and I topped it up. In fact, I took it to over 90% in just about 30 minutes while I had a coffee and a bacon roll. And then I drove from there, I drove another 185 miles to the Porsche Centre South Lakes, um, which is my other stop uh, that I always do, where the Porsche uh, have the external uh, public chargers, where they're 300, I think they're 300 kilowatt chargers, like the Onity ones. And again, another 20 minutes there, took the car up well over 90% charge, and then that took me to Lockerbie. So in fairness, in a six hour drive, I was stopped for just shy of an hour charging up and it was the same coming back. So look at charging speeds is what I'm trying to say. And if you're looking at that and you're doing these longer trips, then you'll need to look at maybe elite, um, trying to find out locations of these sort of like ultra rapid chargers if the cars will take it. Because it makes a trip like that an absolute breeze as far as I'm concerned. Anyway, as I say, so that's it. 270 kilowatt uh, charging speeds, 10 to 80% in 23 minutes on anything above uh, 150 kilowatts or more. Uh, you can charge up, it has an onboard 11 kilowatt charger, so you can charge up if you've got one of the stronger uh, electricity supply at home or at your work, and you can charge from there. Or if you're using a seven kilowatt wall box from home, then you're banking on going from flat to full and probably around about 14 hours. Now, the trip that I've done, as I say, I just had a look at the, the trip meter in there. It's averaging around about 2.7 miles per kilowatt hour, which isn't great. I suppose in efficiency terms, you've got to think of being three and above, uh, really. But what I will caveat that with, bear in mind, literally from my house to my mum's house, is all motorway, probably bar about five miles. It's complete motorway. So sitting on a motorway, you know, sort of like 70, 75 miles an hour with the cruise control on, it didn't do too badly at all. I think this is a really good GT car. I really do. So how does the uh, RS e-tron GT drive? Well, what do you think I'm going to say? It drives amazingly well, this car. Now, the Volkswagen Group, however, do have a little bit of a, a habit of doing this. You see, they say that the, the RS e-tron GT produces 638 brake horsepower which it does but only for a short space of time only in launch it's an overboost thing it's actual real power that delivers all the time is 590 brake horsepower which is still a useful 60 horsepower over the standard car over the standard e-tron gt but why why chase these why give these sort of like you know sort of like headline figures for that launch control thing you know they do that on the skoda Enyaq VRS as well and the ID4 GTX oh it does this it's got this power and it doesn't you've got to have the battery in over 80% charge and all that kind of stuff it's just just tell us what it has and be done with it yeah don't do these silly kind of figures anyway when you do use all of that um, horsepower however um, and boot it from 0 to 60 you'll find that it does the sprint in 3.3 seconds which is plenty fast enough. I mean, okay, it's not as fast as a Tesla Model S Plaid, but very few things are other than falling off the side of a cliff or jumping out of an aeroplane, I suppose. So it's plenty fast enough. However, the performance isn't really what the e-tron RS GT is all about. Now, it's interesting, the RS side of things, because the RS is sort of like Audi's you know, flagship performance brand, if you like. You know, everything it carries the RS badge, the RS3, the RS4, the RS6 as it did. Is always sort of like, you know, the sort of like the very creme de la creme, the you know, the most performance orientated car they do. And obviously with this level of power, there's no real difference with the e-tron GT. However, it's not really about just raw acceleration and performance. It, we need to focus on the GT part of the badge because that's where this car's 40 really lies yes 
If you want scalpel sharp handling uh, and the last word in dynamics, I'd probably suggest the Taycan is the better drive. However, as a Grand Tourer, for doing that sort of like you know sort of like that long-legged drive like the one I've just done over the last few days, I think this is the better car. I really do, and I'll tell you for why. I think it has a much broader range of talents. Yes, when the road turns a little bit twisty and things get a little bit more kind of you know fun, dare I suggest, the the, the e-tron will still handle it. It will still duck into a corner, it'll still seek out the apexes, it'll still you know, make you feel heroic as you get round those series of bends really, really fast. But also when you're not in the mood for that and you just stick on a motorway on the M6 and you want to cruise along at 70 miles an hour, you know, listening to your Spotify and you know, sort of your sunglasses on and not really think about things, it'll do that much, much better than the Porsche does. You get a a ride quality that I'm just in awe of with this car. Most of the time with fast Audis, they tend to be quite nose heavy, or they certainly have in the past, most of the ones I've driven. Um, and you do tend to find that you can feel the weight at the front of the car a lot. Not here. Um, the only Audi that I've driven that, that feels as well balanced as this is an R8. And obviously it's mid-engine, so you know you would expect it to be more balanced. But this is a superbly balanced car. As I say, when you're not in the mood for that sort of like last heroic dive down that you know B road blast, this is the car you want. It really is because it has a level of comfort that really what it's what you want in a GT car. And I've driven lots of G GTs are kind of my car. That's the car I really like. You know whether it's Aston Martins or Bentleys or you know 911 Turbos, it's more of a GT that I get on with rather than a scalpel sharp driver's tool. And I'm going to say something bold here, very bold. I don't think I've driven a finer GT than this, because it's it's what it does. It's the fact that it seems to hit the spot in every single facet of what you want from a GT. It's fast. It's comfortable. It's sharp to drive when the mood takes you. It's commodious. You know, we've seen the space in the back. You can't say that about things like the Aston Martin DB12 um, or, or, or the Bentley Continental GT or the 911 Turbo. You just can't. You know, it's got space in the back for kids. It's got space in the back for two adults. It's got a huge boot. It's easy to drive. It's fun to drive. And it's refined as well. It's a car that just hits every single target that a GT needs to be. And I think, as I say, in terms of its breadth of ability, it is beyond question the best I've driven. It's that good. It is superb. Um, I'll stop waffling for a bit. Let's talk a bit more about the drive and dynamics of the car. So you can choose different drive modes depending obviously on what you want. There's a drive select button down here. Now, um, there's four effective modes. You've got efficiency, which you, you can is pretty much like eco and everything else. Shuts everything down, dulls it all off, ekes out the last bit of mileage that you're going to get from the car. No different to anything else. Uh, then you go to comfort, which is pretty much the default setting and it's where I've spent I'd say 90% of the time with the car in, because again, it's just a really nice balance of everything. Uh, you then go to dynamic mode. Now the car has adaptive dampers, and that stiffens the dampers up, but even so, they are so well judged, these dampers. Audi have just nailed it with them, I think. I don't think there's you know, a, a, another Audi that has the, the comfort plus the, sort of like the lack of body roll, helped in part obviously by the, the, the batteries being down and having a low centre of gravity. But the dampers are so well judged, it's phenomenal. And you go from dynamic and then you go into individual. Now in individual mode, you can set the car up how you like it. And I've, how I've done it is, I've chosen the dynamic sound, so you get that kind of whoa, spaceshipy noise. You get the sharp steering, uh, and you get the really sharp throttle response from the dynamic mode, but the comfort, uh, sorry, I've left the suspension in comfort mode. That's my individual setting, because just allowing that little bit more movement in the wheels and the dampers, just, I think, A, it gives better traction, 
and B, it just smooths everything out. You don't, you're not isolated from the road like you are in the Mercedes EQS or the BMW i7. You know what's going on and that is the difference with this car. It's talking to you, it's communicating with you, it's telling you as a driver what you need to know and that's what I love about it. Um, it's dual motor, obviously, there's a, a single motor up at the front and then there's a twin speed motor at the back like you get in the Taycan. Now you, you've got two speeds on that because what happens is the, 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 the first gear will take the car from, you know, that sort of like rest, that acceleration off the line. So it'll give it its maximum acceleration. And then at higher cruising speed, then the second uh, gear takes over to allow more efficiency and longer legged um, ability. So it is a quattro because as I say, it's, it's dual motor. But unlike a mechanical setup, Audi say that this electronic setup with the twin motors uh, means um, that it's much faster in its reaction time um, in terms of you know where the grip needs to go and having driven the car in streaming wet conditions the other day up the beef tub my favorite road it feels sure-footed you can really feel the chassis working and the grip and the, the you know sort of like the dampers you know everything coming together and as I say allowing you to get a good road under your belt and really enjoy it if you push it too hard, however, there will be an element where you'll go beyond, and I'm not suggesting going beyond the car's limits, but all of a sudden you're very much aware of how heavy the car then becomes. So it gets to a point where it's going balance, 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 and then you go, oh yeah, this is quite a heavy car. And it just kind of tips over the scale a little bit. But I'm talking about being really, really, you know, beyond most people's capabilities um, or abilities by the time you reach that sort of stage. Um, the brakes, the brakes are excellent. Now, on the RS, they are, um, the discs are coated in something called tungsten carbide. Um, no idea what it is, but it's whatever it is, is very, very good. Now, what it, it does is it increases the friction on the discs, so when the pads do uh, lock onto the discs, there's greater friction between the two of them, so better stopping power. It also means it's less prone to um, wear and you don't tend to get the build up of corrosion like you do on uh, discs if the car's been sitting after you've washed it as well. The only time that the brakes, can, sort of like the actual sort of like physical brakes, come into play is when you've gone past 0.3G of braking ability. So up until that point, it's the regeneration of the motor, then it's the pads coming in contact with the disc. But I tell you now, you won't be able to tell the difference. With a lot of cars, you can. You can tell when it goes away from regen and then becomes actual sort of like physical braking. Not with the RS each on, you can. It just goes through um, a very, very smooth and linear um, transition. Apologies, it's a width restriction. It is a wide car, this as well. So that's the brakes. You can adjust regeneration on them via two paddles behind the steering wheel. Audi like Porsche on the Taycan, I've set it up so that its natural or its default setting is to coast. So in other words, you use the brake pedal to make the car stop. Um, so that's its, that's its default setting. You can then dial up uh, regen but via this left paddle. Um, it's never really truly one pedal driving, um, not like you've maybe been used to if you've driven sort of like more kind of, uh, did I suggest one of the mill cars or even some of the big luxury SUVs. But I'm okay with that. I mean, I'm, one pedal driving, a lot of people love it. I, I don't mind it. It has its place. It's mostly in town for me. But I agree with uh, Porsche and Audi. I think as a driver, it's up to you to make the car stop and go. Um, or go and stop as it were so yeah I quite like the way this is set up and as I say the brake pedal feel is absolutely superb uh, the driving position the driving position is exceptional um, I've driven you know sort of like well over I've probably driven over a thousand miles in this car now um, and I just don't feel achy at all in it the seats hold me well apart from the styling, it's the, the, the one thing that most people that I've had in the car have commented on is how nice the seats feel and how nice the car feels and they're saying over a long distance like I've done, they can imagine it being a really, um, a really a, a nice companion to be with and I have to agree with them on that.
Visibility is good. Um, you get nice, reasonably sized door mirrors over your shoulder. Yeah, the rear screen, that rear pillar, it's a little bit of a blind spot there, but to be honest with you, it's not enough to make it warrant silly like saying it's a dreadful car in terms of visibility. There's good old vision all around as far as I'm concerned. It's just that over the shoulder blind spot and that smaller back rear window that's really the, you know, the shorter part um, that, that, that limits your visibility in that sense. The ride quality, as I say, is exceptional. You've got um, uh, McPherson struts up front, a multi-link rear end, um, and again, as I say, with the way the dampers have been tuned, I think it's the best um, balance of ride grip handling in a car um, that I've driven for a very long time. I think it's an exceptionally good car, this, in terms of, as I say, it, it's, a, it's a real Swiss army knife of a car. It just doesn't seem that there's a scenario where it would ever feel um, out of its depth. You know, and that was one thing I was saying to you about, you know, if you watch the Tesla Model S Plaid video that we did, you know, that's a car that kind of struggles to find its place in the world. It's too hard to be a luxury car. It's too sort of like big and wallowy to be a true pin sharp driver's car. It struggles just to find its definition. That's not the case here with this Audi. This Audi knows its place. And as far as I'm concerned, I don't think there's a finer GT car on the market than this. It's absolutely sublime to drive. If there was ever a car that sort of defined what its badge was, it's this. A GT car. And a bloody damn fine one at that. Alright, pricing wise. Well look, it's not going to be a cheap car, is it? Let's be honest, it's Audi's flagship. And, and of course it's the RS model. So prices start from just over £119,000 for the base RS e-tron GT. And that's what this particular car is. There's a couple of options on this particular one. The Suzuka grey metallic paint and something called a Tour Pack, which takes the price around about 121,000. But you move up through two other trim levels as well. You go up through the carbon black edition and then the Vorsprung, and a Vorsprung's around about 140,000 pounds. So, you know, and bear in mind that it really is just sort of like trim and equipment level that you're getting. It's no difference in terms of its power or performance. You know, so 20,000 pounds is quite a lot of money. But if you want to go even cheaper than that, bear in mind, obviously, you can buy an e-tron GT, a non-RS one, which still has 531 horsepower, and has the same 83.7 kilowatt hour on the battery as well. So is the RS really worth it? Only you're going to be able to decide that. All right, competition. Well, of course, it's going to be Porsche's Taycan. It's going to be a main competitor for this car because it sits on the same platform. But they are very different cars in a lot of ways, um, which hopefully you've kind of got my gist of now. But of course, it's going to be a natural competitor you're going to think of because it's obviously a similar style of car and it sits on the same platform and carries a lot of similarities to it. Uh, Mercedes-Benz, of course, we've got the um, Mercedes AMG EQS 53 that we tested as well. So a bit more of a sort of like luxury saloon car, but in terms of performance and its price and sort of like dare I suggest it's sort of like performance credentials um, from the AMG brand that you could maybe see as a natural rival for the car as well. And then, of course, if you're looking at that, then, of course, BMW, they're also doing the i7 with the M70 uh, version of that. Now, that's a car that we're going to be testing as well so but again it's like the mercedes it's more of a kind of luxury limousine style of car with performance rather than a more focused sports gt car um tesla's model s plaid is an interesting one because we've tested that car and as i say it, it kind of struggled to kind of define itself in my book i really like the car i really do and of course it's hampered by being left hand drive only and it, let's be honest it doesn't have the build quality of the audi but it's still a good car and its performance is mind-blowing when it comes to that and it's a little bit cheaper as well but as I say it's left-hand drive certainly in the UK if you're looking at this from one of our other uh, uh, countries that where we get viewers from then obviously it might not be such an issue so maybe you'd look at that car as a rival too there's more cars coming on to market as well so Maserati I always keep mentioning it and of course the Gran Turismo Folgore that's a bit more like it isn't it so it's that GT car that's sort of like okay it's not four doors but it's four seat and you've got that sort of like GT credentials that Maserati have built an illustrious history on and of course they're embracing electrification with the new cars however there's another car coming out very very soon that I think is going to be a real pain in the 
backside for this one and it's from our old friends at Polestar of course the Polestar 5 that's going to be their kind of take on that sort of like luxury five door GT uh, all electric car and we know how good Polestar product is so I think that's the car that's going to give this one a good run for its money certainly so here's what we like and what we don't like about the Audi RS e-tron GT well we like its styling its performance the chassis balance, the refinement, the quality, and the fact that it defines its role as a GT very, very well. We don't like. Well, we do wonder whether or not a real world range of just over 200 miles is really enough for a six figure GT car. The price of some of those better equipped models, the price of some of the options available, and we are wondering whether or not the RS really is worth the extra money over the standard e-tron GT. Sibling rivalries is always a very emotive um, discussion to have. You take two twin brothers, for instance, one's very, very sporty, the other one's much more academic. It's not necessarily saying one's better than the other, it's just that they have a skill set um, that's superior in that particular field. And it's a little bit like the Audi e-tron GT and the Porsche Taycan. If you want to shave those last millimetres off that apex, so you want that nice sharp turn-in feel as a very kind of dynamic sporting drive, then the Taycan is probably the better car. But in terms of being a Grand Tourer, I'm going to give the nod to the Audi, because I think this is a phenomenally good car. In fact, fast Audis, they've always been, they've always been a little bit disappointing in some respects. They've always promised an awful lot, but they've in some respects failed to deliver. They've always felt a bit heavy, a bit ponderous. They, like they're, they're trying to be something that they're not. Well, this car's called GT, and I don't think that there's a car that more sort of like ably fits its name than this one. In fact, I'm gonna go one stage further. In all my years of driving, I don't think I've driven a finer Grand Tourer than this Audi e-tron RS GT. It really is that good. Thank you for watching another episode of Auto EV. As always, please make sure that you are subscribed to the channel. Then once you've done that, make sure you press the little bell button down below because then that way you'll be notified of our next video is uploaded and it goes live. If you've enjoyed the video, please make sure you give it a thumbs up. And of course, leave us your comments and thoughts down below in the comment section. Do you own an Audi e-tron RS GT? Or did you buy the Taycan instead of it? What was your reasons for doing that? Are you looking for this car? Is there something more that I haven't told you in this road test review that you want to know? By all means, send me a question in the comment section because I see I've been spending a huge amount of time with this car and done some big miles in it. So hopefully I'll be able to answer your questions for you. So that's what the comment section is there for. We've got a lovely little community down there and I really really do enjoy it though keep it polite and nice eh? Um, remember we're across all other social media platforms as well so um, Facebook, uh, X, uh, TikTok, Instagram, LinkedIn so please give us a follow there too because that does help the channel as well and if you've enjoyed this and you want to know even more about the electric car world then stick on the YouTube channel now because we've got 160 videos there um, not just road test reviews but uh, used car buying advice van reviews there's some motorbikes on there as well and some twin tests as well for your viewing pleasure and it's not just obviously big fast expensive gt cars we test there's also slightly cheaper electric cars on there too all that remains for me to say is thank you once again for watching thank you thank you thank you for continuing to support auto evs a channel and i'll see you again soon